Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're welcoming Dr. Neil Nathan, who has been practicing medicine for 47 years. Dr. Nathan has been treating chronic complex medical illnesses for 25 years and Lyme disease for the past 15. We're discussing his most recent book, Toxic, Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivities, and Chronic Environmental Illness. So, Dr. Nathan, welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks for having me. Well, you know, I I was so excited about your book. Um, You know, I told you this before the show started, but it's um, not only contains, you know, what basically what I went through as part of my journey 11 years ago, but also, um, you know, what I treat every day and what what I'm trying to convey to people when I do these shows. So thank you so much for putting everything in one place. And you made it very simple for people to read, which is also very helpful. Well, thank you. That was my hope and intention in writing this book. Um, I was trying to reach both healthcare providers and patients who were struggling with things and not um, succeeding or not even getting a clear diagnosis. Well, you know, it, it seems to me that um, it, around the time you started treating Lyme, which is near when I started um, to to recognize Lyme as well, I took my own diagnosis, but that this information was very hard to find. Nobody talked about chemical sensitivities, nobody talked about mold, nobody talked about Lyme back then. And now we've got um, all of this is emerging and there's so much information for people to get better. You know, when I did my treatment, it was it was piecemeal trying to find that information in, in books and online. And it was so obscure when I did find things. So I'm so glad that it's now just part of our mainstream and everybody is aware of what's happening. Well, unfortunately, it's not mainstream yet. Um <laughs> Uh, so I mean, I mean, like know, in this many, kind many of <laughs> yeah, still don't the information fully there. accept the diagnosis of Lyme disease, and many don't know about mold or some of the other things that we'll talk about. Well, so tell me what your practice looks like. Well, um, I mean, I began as a, a basically a family physician who did pretty much everything. I um, worked in the emergency room, delivered babies, did a little bit of surgery and um, had a full gamut of patients. And um, I've always had a particular fascination with helping, um, forgive me, everyone. And um, I began to realize that what I had learned wasn't adequate to help everyone. I knew how to help some people. Um, So I, I began to get referred to me, even from an early time in my practice career, more difficult patients, patients that my colleagues didn't quite know what to do with. And over the years, that has escalated to the point that now pretty much my practice is almost exclusively those uh, patients that my colleagues um, find too sensitive to treat or don't know how to approach or haven't quite got the right diagnosis. Um, So that's kind of what I do all day long. So um, I'm just wondering, I'm curious if this came to you in the same way, um, probably not quite the same way it came to me. I was diagnosed with Lyme and then I started to uh, put all these pieces together. But did did that happen with you where the pieces just kind of came one at a time? Yeah, they did. Um, um, in addition to my normal practice, um, I became very interested in pain management and I ran a um, hospital-based pain management um, uh, wing and clinic um, because over the years I had learned, in addition to conventional medicine, I had learned osteopathic manipulation, acupuncture, a variety of injection techniques. And so I was trying to help, again, the very, very difficult patients that my colleagues had kind of given up on. And back in the 80s, we began to see something that we called fibrositis which we now call fibromyalgia. And 
it was a kind of a strange critter because um, the psychiatrists were telling us that these people were um, anxious and depressed, but no treatment that we provided in that realm helped them. And it became slowly obvious that we were dealing with a, an illness, a physical illness, um, which manifests in many, many complicated ways. So we were seeing a beginning of the epidemic of chronic fatigue syndrome and fibromyalgia. And as we began to learn how to treat those things, it became clear that many of those patients also had Lyme disease or co-infections. As we learned more, it became clear that many of them had mold toxicity. So what we, we now know is a compendium of what we slowly um, evolved, um, as you described in your journey, um, just piecemeal. We began to figure this out, and I hope that my new book will put this together for people in a way that will make it clear and make sense and also give them hope that there's a lot of treatments that they may not have been looking at yet. Well, and I, I think that's where a lot of people get to with treatment. Either they have treatment fatigue because they've tried so much that hasn't worked or no, nothing's worked. So they're just fatigued because they've been sick and doing all these things. Um, so it's it's good information for people that are chronically ill to know that, you know, there might not be a cure for what you have, but but you can have a better quality of life. Yeah, I would like to believe there's actually a cure for everybody. I don't know if that's true, but I, I start every visit with that possibility. So I don't want to ever limit the consciousness of my patient in terms of embracing the possibility of cure. I mean, I've helped countless people who've been sick for 10, 15 years get well. Um, not everyone, but many. So I, I come to the table with the thought that um, help may be possible. We just have to really dig in and look for it. Yeah, that's a good, a good philosophy. Now, your book title is called Toxic. Can you explain what you mean by that? <laughs> sure. Uh, that was actually not my my choice for the book title. Um, I hear I mean, that a lot. <laughs> I think publishers have a lot to do with titles. <laughs> yeah, well, publishers have a lot to do with titles. So. What, what the title is a compromise between my publisher, who I really love, and the, the reality of wanting to get people's attention enough to even pick up the book and look at it. Um, so uh, my title was more in the category of um, how to help people who are unusually sensitive and toxic. And, um, and we changed the name. So modified the cover made it a lot more positive than we had originally kind of laid out there. So yes, it's called Toxic, and, but the subtitle really tells what it's about. It's Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivities, and Chronic Environmental Illness. And that's more descriptive of what the book's about. Um, as I had mentioned, getting, getting referrals from healthcare providers of their most complicated patients, I'm seeing a lot of patients who are unusually sensitive. And many people haven't seen that large a collection of sensitive patients. Um, for physicians who haven't um, had much experience at all, if you have a patient who tells you, um, I can react to a minuscule dose of this medication or even a teeny bit of chlorella or charcoal and I'll get worse for a week or two. And, or um, I take a homeopathic, and I can't do that. That just makes me sick for a week. If you're not familiar with that story, um, many physicians are unfortunately dismissive of those patients and go, well, it's got to be in your head because nobody's that sensitive. And since most of my patients are, um, one of the things I most wanted to get across as a message is, this is not in your head. This is very real. You're not alone. There are hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people out there like you who are reacting to almost everything, and we can figure it out, and we can treat it. So that was a big piece of what I started to put together. 
Well, you know, it, it definitely was. And you made that very clear in your book. I mean, you explained at one point where if somebody drinks a glass of water, they can actually react to it. And mm-hmm. it's not in their head. And, um, you know, I, I want to thank you for putting that information there, because not only was I like that, um, it, it, you know, a lot of people are. And, and as you said, we get dismissed and then we can't get help. And then we're very sick and you don't get, you know, covered by disability and you have no money and you go in this cycle and, and you know, you, you do begin to lose hope, especially when you're told by somebody who's supposed to help you that there's nothing wrong with you when you know that there is. Right. And, and that's a major message, as you're clearly pointing out, Um I wanted both healthcare providers and patients to, to know, um, again, this is not in your head. And, and as you've already experienced, this is extremely divisive in families because often the family, spouses, um, mothers, fathers, and relatives are being told by these doctors that, no, th- this isn't possible that your loved one is experiencing. This is in their head. And, and just kind of like pat you on the head and go, um, you just need some Prozac or um, Xanax and and go away because I don't know what to do with you. And, and then and then you react to the medication and you yeah, don't get very that far. That message yeah. is so negative and so wrong and inappropriate that I really wanted to emphasize um, that pleas for family members, for your loved ones, for your friends, who are describing these things to you, believe them. You know, people, with very few exceptions, people almost never make this up. They are just trying to explain to you what they're experiencing. It is very real. And here's the big part. We, we know a lot about what actually causes it so we can now treat it. Um, so can you explain the difference between, because you said toxicity and sensitivity. What, what is the difference between those two? Well, the big difference is in the, in the systems of the body that are being affected. So sensitivity almost always involves a hyperreactive nervous system where the brain and the specific areas of the brain are essentially inflamed and they become um, super reactive to stimuli that normally you would barely even acknowledge. So sensitivity involves overreaction to light, sound, touch, chemicals, um, uh, and uh, virtually any stimulus can um, can set a patient off. And other people who are in the same room, for example, a uh, sense of smell may not even perceive what another person is reacting to badly. So so that's sensitivity. Toxicity is when there's actually a toxin that is in the body, such as mold toxin, heavy metals, uh, chemicals, pesticides, which are literally poisoning the body's systems and making them sick. And so this affects every system of the body, but often it involves um, making that person unable to detoxify so that their lungs, kidney, gut, liver um, isn't working up to snuff. Now, toxicity and sensitivity sometimes look similar in terms of reaction. So that, for example, you've got a mold patient who is very, very sensitive, and you give them some chlorella at a dose that most people would handle easily, it can actually mobilize toxin so fast that the patient can't keep up with that and they will become more toxic. And that will give them symptoms that will exacerbate what they're, what they're suffering with. Example, um, cognitive impairment, um, numbness and tingling in different parts of the body, pain in their muscles and joints, and so on, um, that can worsen even with a light dose of chlorella. So that's toxicity, but it looks to the uninitiated like sensitivity because it is often involving a reaction of that toxin to the nervous system. So it's very helpful to separate them so that you can be clearer about what you're treating 
also understanding that there's an overlap and you may be needing to treat both. So when you start treating somebody who is like this um, and they're going to react to everything that, that you do, what approach do you take? Well, as a general rule, most of those individuals um, will not be able to do the treatments that they need to get well. I'm going to back up for a minute. The vast majority of these patients have got either mold toxicity and or um, Lyme disease or co-infections, particularly Bartonella. And they may have other things as well, such as mast cell activation, which is triggered by that. So ultimately, they won't get well unless you treat what's causing it. But many of these folks, you can't even get started on treatment until you quiet down that hyperreactive nervous system. So... I think of treatment in terms of stages, which is step one or stage one, would be how do you quiet that nervous system? And you would begin by, um, first of all, quieting down the inflammation of the limbic system and addressing the inflammation of the vagus nerve. And we can talk about both of them separately. Okay, well, let's do that when we come back from our break so that we have time. Um, yeah. We're talking today with Dr. Neil Nathan, and um, he we're discussing his book, Toxic. So we'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. The largest syndicated alternative health talk program has come to the Voice America Network. The Dr. Bob Martin Show is the program that will answer your health questions and help you to heal your own body of many different ailments. Each week, you'll hear the answers that Dr. Bob gives to his callers that help them to be their own doctor most of the time. We'll also discuss developments on the health care front and what you need to do to keep your body in top form. The Dr. Bob Martin Show airs Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single-day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-294. 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on demand access to past events that you may have missed, by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Dr. Neil Nathan, and we're discussing his book, Toxic, Heal Your Body from Mold Toxicity, Lyme Disease, Multiple Chemical Sensitivities, and Chronic Environmental Illness. So, Dr. Nathan, before the break, you talked about inflammation of the limbic system. Can you explain to us what that is and how you would treat it? Sure. The the limbic system is um, a part of the brain, uh, focused on a part of the brain we call the amygdala, with connections to other parts of the brain. 
And the important part here is that the limbic system is primarily connected to how we experience emotion and is also connected to um, fatigue, cognitive difficulties, and pain. And those areas are central features of many of our chronically ill patients. Um, Most of our patients have chronic fatigue. Most of them have some degree of cognitive difficulty, difficulty with brain fog, focus, memory, and concentration. Many of them have pain. Um, And emotional piece is very important because many of our patients have, um, out of the blue, developed intense anxiety, depression to the point of despair, and even feelings of what we call depersonalization, where they don't feel like themselves. And so the limbic system is the part of the brain that that monitors that, experiences that, and controls that. And one of the things that we've learned is that that part of the brain is inflamed in our patients with mold toxicity and Lyme, particularly the co-infection Bartonella. So that's what the limbic system is. Um, And we've recognized that it's really important to quiet that down in order for patients to make progress. Uh, So one of your countrywomen, Annie Annie Hopper, um, developed back in the mid-2000s a program that she called Limbic Retraining, which is now called DNRS, Dynamic Neural Retraining Systems, which is kind of a series of exercises and visualizations that specifically quiets the limbic system. It's a wonderful system for those uh, individuals who are suffering with these kind of issues. You can get Annie Hopper's uh, DVD tapes or go to one of her lecture series and begin the process of quieting, which to me is essential. Um, There's another individual named Ashok Gupta, that's A-S-H-O-K-G-U-P-T-A, who has a similar system as well, and and that's become one of the mainstays for my really sensitive patients. Um, Am am I explaining that adequately? Yeah, I was was just going to add, I mean, I've um, had some patients do these programs um, or a cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, They're very similar, it seems, and I find it very helpful. I think we get stuck not only in our, our pain patterns, but our thought patterns, uh, you know, you know that that despair, or I'm never going to get better, or and we don't even realize we can't recognize that that we're there, and to have somebody help us recognize where we are, and then work on you know turning that around is a very important part of of healing because you're not going to heal completely if you don't assess all parts of of who you are. Yeah, I, I agree completely. The, the concept of, quote, I'll never get better becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy unless you rewrite it. So mm-hmm. it's, it's really um, important. I agree completely. Yeah. And I'm sure that you've seen this as well, people that, that won't do this work or won't assess that. They actually end up um, self-sabotaging their treatment. Mm-hmm. It's it's almost predictable. I won't get better. So, um, you know, they just won't do anything and they end up, you know, disappearing or, or not getting better um, because they have that stronghold belief. And even if they are better, they can't see it because they have those blinders of I'm not going to. And mm-hmm. you can show them how much better they are and they will still say no. Yeah, very true. I mean, there are some patients whose concept of healing is, unless I'm completely back to where I was when I started, I'm nowhere. And some of them just have difficulty, as you're pointing out, even recognizing how much better they are. Uh, which, which I know is human human nature. I've had lots of conversations on this show about this, but I'm glad that you are are talking about it as well. It's an important piece to the puzzle. You can treat the mold and you can treat the lime and you can take all the things you're supposed to. And if you're stuck in that loop, you're still going to have, you know, you're still going to be in that loop, really. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. So what do you mean um, by the dysfunction of the vagus nerve? Okay. So the second big peach big piece, sorry, which um, interweaves profoundly with the limbic system is that of the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is 
a very important nerve that comes out of the brain, the 10th cranial nerve, and it supplies super important organs like the lungs, the heart, the intestines, and many of the internal organs. Also, and really important, is it is a major contributor to what we call the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, I'm, I suspect that most listeners have heard of the autonomic nervous system, which we have long broken down into two parts, the sympathetic system, which we call the fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which is the relaxational system. There's a new conceptualization that has expanded this recently that is called polyvagal theory. And in it, what we've learned is that there's actually a branch of the vagus nerve that controls what I'm going to call safety. So that if a, an individual or being does not feel safe, that nervous system goes on hyper alert, hyper vigilant mode to monitor that environment so that they can, it, in an attempt to protect them from some threat in the environment. So for many of my patients who are hyper-reactive to light, sound, touch, chemicals, food, things like that, um, their nervous system is hardwired. It didn't start that way, but it's become hardwired in an attempt to keep them safer. If you will, this is a little bit like um, the illness itself has caused a PTSD type reaction for that individual. So that they're um, jumpy and interpret almost all stimuli as potentially threatening. That's why they can't take a lot of medications because their nervous system is giving them the message, mm, I don't know if that's safe for you, so I'm going to react to it until I'm certain that it's safe. So a huge piece that we've also learned recently that dovetails with the limbic system is to quiet the reactivity of the vagus nerve to help that person feel safe. Because if you don't feel safe, you're just not going to get well. That's just another component of healing. Well, this sounds a lot um, like it, it's related to adrenal fatigue, so that fight-flight mode as well, where you're, um, you know, your body's um, protecting itself, and right. so then, of course, your cortisol levels are off, and and um, you're tired or wired or both. Um, it, and it is, and it does. But I want to emphasize that um, this supersedes the adrenal, so that. You can work on the adrenal, you can diagnose adrenal fatigue, you can measure DHEA, you can measure cortisol, you can give that to the patient. They often won't respond well to it until you fix what is messing it up in the first place, which is what I'm calling vagus nerve dysfunction. So okay. uh, there's a number of ways of addressing it early on. Um, number one, uh, I would... Um, ask readers who are int- uh, listeners who are interested in this to to get a book by a fellow named Stanley Rosenberg called Accessing the Healing Power of the Vagus Nerve. And in it, not only does it describe this, but at the back of the book, there are 10 very simple exercises that specifically quiet the vagus nerve and the related cranial nerves. Um, Rosenberg himself is a cranial practitioner, so patients who have access to good um, osteopathic craniosacral work will benefit greatly by combining that with um, those exercises. Um, And lastly, there's another technology which uh, many listeners will have access to called frequency-specific microcurrent, which has specific uh, ways of calming the vagus nerve. So that in patients who are unusually sensitive or reactive, I will often start with working on the vagus nerve, working on the limbic system for four to six weeks. Um, For most of my patients, this will not only quiet it down and let us move forward, but it will actually make them feel markedly better and help them to realize, ah, I'm on the right path. This this type of treatment is actually going to get me somewhere. Um, so, and you also talk in your book about um, mast cell activation. How, what mm-hmm. is that, and how important is it? 
Well, again, it's important. So and if I talked about stages, for me, stage one is quieting the nervous system. Stage two is looking for and treating mast cell activation. Mast cell acti- Let's talk about mast cells. Mast cells are an immune cell that are made by the bone marrow that are present in every single tissue of the body, but in highest quantities in the tissues that are in closest contact with the outside world, namely the sinus and gut areas. And their job is to coordinate how the body deals with toxins and infectious agents. And for some people, these mast cells get so overworked uh, repeatedly dealing with toxins and infectious agents that they become overexcited, um, overreactive, and then they start to react to things that they're not actually supposed to. Mast cells primarily make histamine, as well as 200 other um, uh, biochemical mediators, so that when the mast cell gets activated, it may inappropriately release histamine um, very quickly in response to being stimulated. To be more specific, um, if someone reports to me that within minutes of eating or drinking something, they have flushing, hives, itching, sweating, palpitations, abdominal pain, um, or a host of other symptoms, but these are pretty prominent ones, if it occurs really quickly after eating, this isn't food allergy. This is a mast cell activation with a release of histamine. And this tells us that these are folks that we want to start pre-treating with materials that will quiet the mast cells so that, again, we can move forward to more specific treatment. So um, do you find that this is a component of the patients that are um, toxic and sensitive quite often? Very often. I would estimate that well over 50% of patients with mold toxicity have mast cell activation, and a high percentage of patients with Lyme disease and Bartonella have mast cell activation. Yes. So one thing that is emerging um, and we're getting more information on is um, genetic SNPs. um, And you do talk about them a little bit in your book. So do you find that the mast cell issue is temporary because of the toxicity or is it more on a genetic side for people? There is a rare genetic disorder which will cause mast cell activation. But it's mostly, from my perspective, um, not as directly related to SNPs as it is to what is irritating the mast cells, namely toxins, the most common of which is mold toxicity, and infections such as Bartonella. By by far, that's more common. Um, The SNPs may help us to address some of the underlying genetic potential that predispose some patients to get well. And I do have a chapter in the book written by a an an excellent practitioner named Bob Miller who has developed some wonderful um, insights about which SNPs are the most relevant and how to treat them. So I would encourage folks that are interested in that to read his chapter in my book. Um, yeah, I, I've heard Bob Miller talk, and I, um, you know, I, I love the genetic aspect. But the, you know, it does just show potential. We don't really know until we dive in there, um, you know, what's going on and and how how permanent it is and if it's going to turn around. Um, so it really, it is also finding out what the root cause is, like you said, the mold toxicity or the lime or the metals or whatever else is going on. Right. There's a component of the genetics that, that I, I don't like to focus on because many um, patients don't really understand it. And as you pointed out correctly, it's about genetic potential. It doesn't mean those genes have been expressed. And there isn't any way to know if they've been expressed or not. We don't really quite know how to do that. And my concern is that a number of individuals have looked at or been told uh, by practitioners that, oh, genetically you're a mess. Oh, I don't know if you can ever get well. And, and I really um, not only hate that message, I disagree with that message because I don't think that hinders healing. We can incorporate that into healing, but I, I, the take-home message 
that you are genetically unable to get well is one that I think has has caused a great deal of harm. And I really want to um, do what we can to undo that message because I don't think it's correct. Well, and I, I do agree with you. I actually love doing um, genetic testing with with patients, but um, I, I'm I'm always cautious because. It, it can reestablish that I can't I can't heal and I and I don't want to do that and you know genetically I think I could be in a category of a mess but I got better and mm-hmm. um, and you know I, I, I want to stress that because although that had a component with how sick I was because I was bedridden and I had 120 symptoms um, I I I am better now. And um, it, it only took three years for that process to happen for me without the genetic testing that we have now. So um, no matter what you've been told or, or what's going on there, although it might be a component, it will not hinder. You just need to know what's going on and treat it. Yeah. And, and again, I agree completely. Yeah. Um, we don't want our genetics to be an excuse that we can't heal. Because to be honest, I don't think it's a good excuse. No. We can circumvent that with a wide variety of uh, healing strategies. Yeah. Well, and I, I point out to people that we can know that we have genetics for heart disease or type 2 diabetes, but that doesn't mean we're going to get it because we just look at, okay, so this was, say, someone in my family, a parent or whatever. I'm going to do what I can to prevent that from becoming an issue. So we, we can use it more as a preventative or, or just staying healthy on, on some regard, but it, it does not determine our future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, agreed. Uh, So we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Dr. Neil Nathan. We're discussing his book, Toxic, and we'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has a mobile app for iOS, Android, or Amazon Kindle. Visit the Apple App Store, Amazon, or Google Play to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. What causes us to be sick? We're not talking about the actual illness or the scientific cause of illnesses. We're talking about your body and health. Listen for the healing whisper of Return to Peace. Each week, host Dr. Marianne Chase shows you how to listen to your heart to identify poor health, stress, and disease. You'll learn how to heal energetically and spiritually as well as physically. It's time to depend less on the drugs and more on the heart. The Healing Whisper airs live every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health & Wellness. We're on the pulse of the world with great shows and hosts. The Voice America Health & Wellness channel is also on Twitter. We've got ideas to keep you healthy, breaking health news, and more. Follow us on Twitter at Voice AM Health. That's at Voice AM Health. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Dr. Neil Nathan, and we're discussing his book, Toxic. Um, So I I was just wondering if you could let us know how somebody could even be aware that that this situation that you and I are talking about, toxic, sensitive, Lyme, mold, is an issue for them. What would they look for? Yeah, great question. Um, So for listeners uh, to think about Um, Could this be you? Could it be a loved one, a family member, or a friend? 
what we're looking for is a wide, wide array of symptoms, um, so wide that that for physicians who don't know what they're looking at, uh, they'll often say this is in your head. But we're looking at uh, fatigue, cognitive impairment with brain fog, focus, memory, concentration issues. We're looking at pain for many patients, uh, both joint pain and muscle pain, muscle weakness, um, dizziness, um, um, disequilibrium where people lose their balance somewhat regularly. Very important, we're looking at intense mood swings, anxiety, um, depression to the point of despair and hopelessness at times, which seems to come out of the blue, looking at uh, uh, pins and needles sensations um, in various parts of the body, Um, the sensitivities that we talked about. Now, a couple of symptoms are unusually diagnostic um, for this particular condition, particularly mold. For example, if if you're experiencing electrical sensations or an ice pick type of pain, that's fairly classical for mold. If you experience an unusual sensation, like a, a feeling of vibration internally, could be anywhere in the body, uh, it doesn't show up on the outside, but you can feel it on the inside, that's particularly diagnostic for mold or Bartonella. Um, so these are the things we're looking at. If you've been given a diagnosis and the word atypical is in that diagnosis, for example, if you've seen a neurologist and they're describing atypical Alzheimer's, atypical MS, um, atypical Parkinson's disease, um, that word is a tip-off that you may be looking at mold or Lyme. If a neurologist is looking at seizures or dyskinesias, and they're calling them pseudo-seizures, again, that's a tip-off that this is what you're looking at. So those are kind of a quick overview of the kinds of symptoms that um, if you or loved ones have and have not been given an adequate explanation in conventional medicine, uh, start thinking along these lines. Well, and... um I actually had all those symptoms and they were exactly what you're explaining. Um, so it, it, it's, um, it, 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 I, I like hearing that, um, you know, at the time you're diagnosed, you feel pretty alone. And um, although I've talked to lots of people and done lots of shows, it's nice to hear that there is um, now this information, as I said earlier, for, for people. And it, it, it's taking less time for people to figure this out. It took me 14 years, and um, I don't think that average is as high anymore as it was, you know, when you and I started dealing with Lyme. Um, but those, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Sure. Um, so when we're looking at mold, um, can you just explain kind of why that's an issue and what people should look for? Well, again, uh, um In terms of symptoms, that's what we're looking for. Um, It's important that people start thinking about whether or not they have ever been in a moldy environment. And that would mean um, seeing mold visually or smelling it. One of the really important things we've learned is that if the immune system has gotten weakened, could be from Lyme or co-infections or from mold itself, that body becomes much more likely to let the mold start growing or colonizing in their um, intestines um, or in their sinuses. This is a huge piece of the puzzle because for many, many patients, they don't get ill until many years after their exposure because if their immune system takes a hit from either a severe infection, from surgery, from childbirth, um, any number of very stressful things, will allow um, an, a non-intact immune system can no longer contain that and the mold starts growing and releasing toxins into that body. Now, the person may no longer be in that environment. I mean, just to, I mean we learned this from some uh, wonderful work done in a paper published in 2013 by uh, Dr. Joe Brewer, who took... 112 patients with chronic fatigue and measured 
um, their urine mycotoxins, the mold toxins in their urine, and he discovered quite to his surprise that 93% had significant amount of mold toxin in their urine. And even better, when he treated them, they got well. So as he studied those patients, he was a little bit baffled initially that um, many of them had no mold currently in their home or work environment. But as they reflected on it, they would say, you know, five years ago, I was living in a really moldy house, or 10 years ago, or 15 years ago. So one thing for our listeners to be aware of is if you, if you have these symptoms and have ever been in a moldy environment, this is something that may indeed apply to you. And the testing for it we, we have now evolved is quite accurate um, and involves uh, submitting a urine specimen to one of two laboratories to get it analyzed. And that would be the real-time laboratory uh, in the States or the Great Plains laboratory in the States. So um, what is the relationship between mold and Lyme? Totally interrelated, which is um, if you have mold, your immune system is weakened so that Lyme may flourish and vice versa. If you have Lyme, your immune system is weakened and mold may take foot. So each weakens the body, and unfortunately, in an exponential way. And also, unfortunately, because of that, mold is much, much more common than you would think in Lyme patients. Um, um, I, I would submit to you that many Lyme patients who have improved but have not gotten better um, may have mold that is undiagnosed and needs to be treated. And I, I really um, am hoping that listeners um, who are hearing this can take that to their healthcare practitioners and go, huh, maybe I should be tested for it because I will really encourage that. Well, and there, there's a, a misconception still going around about Lyme that the treatment will be short and um, that you'll get better with, you know, a little bit of treatment. And um, if mold is is playing a role um, or some of the other co-infections or everything we're talking about, um, I, I'm going to say that's not the case, that it's not that easy. It's not that easy. And um, the reason that they're exponentially working with each other is that both stimulate the release of inflammatory cytokines that keep this whole process going. The inflammatory cytokines that mold releases and that Lyme and Bartonella releases um, distract the immune system from being able to cure the underlying infection so that it becomes imperative that you ferret out exactly what the causes are and treat them if someone's going to get better. And as you're pointing out, it can take between one and five years to clear the mold, and it can take the same amount of time for Lyme. It's not a short journey for those people who think you can take antibiotics for a week and a half. Um, that, that's not going to cure acute Lyme, and it sure won't do much to prevent or, or treat chronic Lyme. So, I mean, we're also talking about people who are having these complexes that they're um, also sensitive and toxic. So we know mm -hmm. that um, you can't just look at somebody, do a bunch of tests and say, okay, you've got mold and Lyme and these co-infections and here's 10 things for you to take as treatment and off you go and you'll be better. I'm guessing that it's not going to work that way. Well, most of those, it depends on the constitution of the, of the patient. If someone has an unusually strong constitution, you might be able to get away with that. Um, give them um, full doses of everything right from the get-go. A few people can handle that, and they will do well with that. But with my patients who are sensitive or toxic or both, that strategy is not going to work. That will throw them under the bus so hard and so fast that uh, it'll take months for them to come back up to the surface. Um, so you have to proceed with each person individually, very slowly, very gently, using tiny amounts of materials. One of the questions that comes up for almost everyone is, okay, if I have mold and Lyme, which one do you treat first? 
And the answer is almost always mold first. Um, it is somewhat easier to treat. The treatment is somewhat less toxic because we're not using antibiotics. We're not going to mess with the microbiome. Um, and it's better tolerated. Even so, with very, very sensitive patients, you need to proceed with tiny doses of materials that do not get that individual to react at all. Well, and and I would guess they'd also have to um, get out of the uh, toxic environment if they're still in it. Oh, yeah, that's job, for mold, that's job one. You cannot heal if you are in a moldy environment, home, work, car. Um, Step one is to analyze your environment or have an environmental um, specialist look at your environment to be sure that you're not ongoing exposed because otherwise uh, you're going to be treading water. So you've mentioned the immune system a little bit, especially in relationship to the Lyme and the mold. And um, you have a, a, a bit in your book where you talk about rebooting the immune system. So why is that necessary and what do you do for it? Well, all these systems really need to be rebooted. It, it's not... The issue is, you know, in, in some of the earlier books that I wrote, uh, we were able to successfully treat most of our patients with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue with um, uh, supporting their adrenal, thyroid, sex hormones, magnesium, getting the gut, the intestinal dysbiosis, food allergy. Uh, taking care of all of that really cured a large percentage of our patients. Um, now, I'm seeing different patients, but I also want to point out that this world that we're living in is getting really, really toxic quickly. And we're not seeing the same thing anymore where simply a little bit of adrenal support no longer has the same profound effect on that body. Um, the, the growing toxicity that we have with heavy metals, pesticides, chemicals, electromagnetic stimulation... It's a different ball game out there, and um, we really have to get our world cleaned up, and we need to do it now. We're running out of time to the luxury of time to think about it. Um, this is on us already, and the epidemic that we're seeing of Lyme, mold toxicity, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, autism, neurodegenerative disease, we're talking millions and millions of people. This is not a small handful. So this is something we really have to begin to work with um, immediately. Um, well, th- thank you for saying that. Um, it's probably a good place to be ending our show. I think that that comes up on every show I do, that really the root cause of everything we're dealing with is how toxic everything is, our food, our environment, our emotions, and our, our even our society, just um, with all the stress that we're under. Um, so that's it. And if anybody wants to understand more about what we've been talking about, um, your your book is really great for that and very simple to read. Can you just let us know how people can get a hold of that or if they have more any more questions or if they need more information, what they should do? Well, sure. My, my book should be available for most booksellers, certainly through Amazon. It's uh, got both paperback and Kindle components. Um, you can go to my website, which is uh, neilnathanmd.com for more information. Um, So I encourage people to do that. Also, I'd like listeners to be aware of an organization called ICI, I-S-E-A-I, the International Society for Environmentally Acquired Illness, which is going to have its first um, national meeting uh, this coming May. And we are putting together a certification program for healthcare practitioners. And this organization, we hope, will be on the forefront of teaching healthcare practitioners about how to diagnose and treat these illnesses and put this all together. So oh, that's perfect. You all will it's a, look at the ICI website. Yeah, it's, it's about time that we had something like that. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I absolutely love this conversation. Okay, uh, thank you so much for having <laughs> me, and I hope that my book will be able to bring help to those countless suffering people out there that need this information. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, if anybody listening wants more information about my story and what I went through, my journey's on my blog site at dr-risks.com, where you can also access all of my uh, past shows for the last three years. Um, if you have any questions, you can send me an email or don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Thank you so much for listening today and be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. 